Okay, so uh, here we are, our uh, second day. Uh, we're gonna start with chapter three. Uh, if you are uh, using the book, the one that I recommend, not the one that's free, that's required, but the one I recommend, uh, this is the third chapter, it's called The New Genetics. And actually what I'm gonna talk about is not really that new, I'm gonna talk about just the stuff that's been known for a while. But the science of genetics or the field of genetics has been advancing very rapidly. And it's uh, a lot of the stuff that, uh, well, the new advances, it's just, uh, well, it's beyond the scope of this course. So I'm just gonna stick to some basics and move on from there. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this stuff. Uh, you probably already know most, if not all this stuff, a lot of you. Um, so if you've taken a science class before, a biology class or something. So genetics, we're gonna talk about what DNA is, genes, chromosomes, sex chromosomes, genome. Do pay attention if you, if you want to, unless you have something else going on. But you do have to log, be logged in for the purposes of attendance. But uh, there might be some interesting stuff that comes up, okay? Even though a lot of this stuff is kind of basic. We'll talk about all this stuff, alleles and all this stuff, genetic disorders and stuff. And we'll talk about reproduction just at the cellular level, okay? Um, so uh, let's get started. This is just our overview. Okay, so we'll start with genetics, just defining genetics. Genetics is a field of study uh, uh, all of its own, okay? So the study of genetics, um, so genetics is the study of the genetic makeup of individuals and its influence on physical and behavioral characteristics, okay? That's the study of genetics. Now I'm just gonna tell you some basic things that you've probably already heard of, like DNA. I don't have the full name there, but for some reason I know it. It stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. acid. And it's basically chemical information uh, that contains uh, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, basically. Um, these, uh, this information, right, uh, is basically makes up the instructions uh, for your cells. It is chemical information. It is basically like a blueprint instructions uh, for cells to manufacture proteins. And then the proteins, you know, basically make up uh, everything else. Proteins manufacture things, okay? Uh, DNA is contained in every cell nucleus. Every cell nucleus has this DNA. And, uh, and cells uh, basically make up all physical aspects of human beings, okay? Of all living things, actually. Uh, cells uh, will make up your organs, your bones, your skin, all that stuff. Uh, uh, you know, plants, anything that's alive is made of cells. Even your hair, your bones. Um, so that's DNA. Now DNA is contained in genes. So it's a matter of degrees here. So DNA is the uh, basically chemical information from those four base pairs, okay? And genes are segments of DNAs. Genes are basically a section of all this information, okay? One section. So it's a section of DNA uh, that directs the synthesis of proteins and enzy enzymes. So, so genes is a piece, of a, a piece of instructions. It's like the instructions for something. And these genes then, uh, you know, do certain things. They can be on or off sometimes, uh, but it's information. It's, it's like a set of blueprints, okay, for something. And I, I mentioned already that proteins are necessary to create and develop uh, physiological structures and their behaviors, okay? So these proteins are basically, um, you know, create all these other things, okay? And the DNA, the genes are kind of like the instructions. It's a matter of degree, okay? DNA is contained in genes, okay? And then genes are contained in chromosomes. So genes have many pieces of DNA, and then many genes are in chromosomes. Chromosomes are larger. Chromosomes look like kind of like rods. Some of them are kind of look like they're twisted, but rod-like structures that contain genes. They contain uh, many genes. Each normal human has 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. And the 23rd pair or the one that we call the 23rd pair is known as your sex chromosomes. If you're a male, you're X and Y. If you're female, you're XX. So those are your sex chromosomes. And if you look at some images, which um, I believe some are coming up, uh, you'll see that the, you know, the sex chromosomes, the, the female uh, sex chromosomes really do look like X's. And for the, y, for the males, the Y looks like it's been cut off a little bit and looks a little bit more like a Y. So you've heard about this stuff, uh, unless you've been living in a cave somewhere, but you know, if you've had any education, any science class, you've heard about that. Okay. so. Cells, okay, contain a nucleus. Inside the nucleus, we have, um, okay, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 
and you can see some images there. An image there, I know it's kind of small, especially if you're looking at it on, on a cell phone. Um, 23 pairs of chromosomes. And here's a chromosome enlarged right there, an image of one. And then if you unravel it, a piece of that chromosome would be a gene. And then a piece of the gene is the DNA. So it's just a matter of degree. DNA is con contained in genes. Genes are contained in chromosomes. Chromosomes are contained in the nucleus, and the nucleus is in the cell. And everything, all living things are made of cells. Okay? Let's keep going. Uh, the genetic code. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? 46 chromosomes, every normal human being. Okay? And there's about 21,000 genes, okay, that direct the synthesis, uh, that, you know, that direct specific proteins, right, to form the 20 amino acids, and then things are manufactured from there. Okay? And there's 3 billion base pairs of chemicals, right? If you were to take all the base pairs, all the combinations, right, um, you know, A with T and, and so on, uh, there's about 3 billion steps, you could say, right? Remember, some of you may have heard that uh, basically uh, DNA looks like a twisted ladder. Well, think of that ladder as having steps, and there's about 3 billion of those steps. That's a lot. It's a lot of genetic information. I had a normal human being, okay? Um, let's talk about something a bit more interesting. There's alleles. Okay, so speaking of genes, uh, genes come in different forms. And those forms are called alleles, okay? Like for instance, you're, um, you might have a homozygous alleles. So that means your genes take the same form. They're, they're identical. Like for instance, and I know on the PowerPoint here, uh, the, uh, the pictures here are kind of blocking some of the words. I should remember what they are, but if you do download the PowerPoint, it's not going to be like that. For some reason, when I present using my iPad, um, it moves things around a little bit like this. You can see it's moved around some of the bullets there, and it might even mess with the numbers a little bit, but the information is there if you download it. Okay, so alleles are different forms of a gene. So if you have brown eyes, Okay, let's say, um, and your genes for brown eyes are homozygous. That means that uh, basically you have two identical uh, genes for brown eyes. You got one from your mother, one from your father. And if you're homozygous for brown eyes, that would be big B. You can't see it. Big B, big B. Uh, that means that uh, you would have brown eyes and it's homozygous. Uh, your alleles, uh, your, the form of your genes can also be heterozygous meaning that um, they're different, okay? So you can have brown eyes, but you might have big B, little b. You got a big B for brown eyes from, let's say, your father, and you got a little b. b little b stands for blue eyes. You have a blue eye gene from your mother. So your genes for eye color are heterozygous. In other words, you have a gene for brown eyes, and you have a gene for blue eyes. And what happens is brown eyes are dominant, okay? If the gene is dominant, um, then uh, that allele, the allele is dominant, that means it has a more powerful influence. So the brown eye gene will basically wipe out usually the effect of the blue eye gene. And you'll just be, you'll have brown eyes, okay? Now I know there, that there's other combinations. You can have the hazel, okay? Or dark brown eyes or, you know, light brown eyes. Uh, you know, and different things because eye color is a little bit more complicated than we're making it out to be. But here's the thing. You can have brown eyes and have a blue eye gene, okay? Uh, my son is that way. He has brown eyes and actually big, dark brown eyes, but he has a blue eye gene because his mother has blue eyes. And uh, he got a brown eye gene for me, but the brown eye gene he got from me is so strong that it totally wiped out the effect of the blue eye gene. Now, what, it's really melanin. The brown eye genes basically say that your eyes should get a lot of melanin, and that makes them darker and make them brown. The blue eye gene basically says, let's give them only a little bit of melanin. And uh, if you have only a little bit of melanin, a little bit of eye color, your eyes appear blue, okay? And if you have very little melanin, then they appear even lighter blue, okay? Um, so my son got the brown eye gene and the blue eye gene from his mother, and the brown eye gene he got from me it's a very strong brown eye gene, totally wiped out the blue eye gene. He just looks like he has brown eyes. You wouldn't know that he has a blue eye gene, okay? But he does because the brown eyes are dominant. Now, the recessive, the blue eye, the blue eye gene is recessive. That allele is recessive. It has a weak influence. So it basically um, 
if, if, it, uh, if it combines with a dominant gene, it will not show up, it will not be expressed. In order to get blue eyes, you need a blue eye gene from your mother and one from your father. So you need blue eye genes for both your parents, okay? Which basically says, you know, uh, that let's give this person just a little bit of melanin in his eyes or her eyes, and then your eyes would appear blue. It's a little bit more complicated, like I said, often you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you have the brown eye gene, it turns out that some brown eye genes are stronger than others, okay? Um, like for instance, my daughter has uh, the brown eye gene as well, and she got a blue eye gene from her mother. But my daughter's eyes are hazel. They're kind of look greenish, yellowish, that kind of stuff, depending on the amount of light that, that is hitting them. Um, and what that is, is that she got a blue eye gene from her mother, which says, okay, you get a, only a little bit of melanin, so your eyes will be blue. And she was born with blue eyes. Her eyes looked blue at the beginning. But then as she got a little bit older, her eyes changed a little bit because she has a brown eye gene from me. And the brown eye gene basically says, okay, let's give you more melanin. But the brown eye gene is not a very strong brown eye gene. She got a weaker one and it didn't completely wipe out the effect of the blue eye gene. And so her eyes are kind of multicolored. So that's what happens when you get a weak brown eye gene and a blue eye gene your eye color is somewhere in between. But my son got the strong brown eye gene and the blue eye gene, so his eyes are just brown. It's interesting how uh, eye color is a little bit more complicated than we think, okay? But just to, for the basics to understand how it works, how these different alleles combine, and they can be homozygous, heterozygous, dominant, recessive, that's why we're talking about this. And that's an approximation, but it's not exact the way that works. But, it, but that does work that way. It's just that it's not, it, there are complications. Uh, the, the genes can also be co-dominant, meaning that they're equally dominant. In the case of uh, blood type, uh, the A, blood type A, the gene for blood type A and the gene for blood type B are equally dominant. So if you get the, the gene for blood type A, let's say from your mother and the gene for blood type B from your father, uh, you'll have blood type AB, which is very rare for some reason. It's very rare. Um, but if you have blood type O, that is recessive. Okay, so if you, if you get blood type O from your father and blood type A from your mother, you will be AO, you will have basically blood type A, okay? And you could get A from your mother, A from your father, you're also blood type A, okay? But in that case, it's homozygous. Same thing with B, if you get, a, if you get blood type B from your mother, blood type O from your father, you have blood type B. And I, as far as I, I know, I have blood type A. We did a little experiment in science class which was illegal, by the way. The teacher was not allowed to do that, not allowed to mess with blood and having us prick our fingers, but he did that. And I almost passed out when they did that test because of the smell of blood and the sight of blood makes me want to pass out. But I remember being told, oh yeah, you have blood type A. I don't know if it's true. Maybe I should ask the doctor if that experiment was done correctly. Uh, your genes can also be additive, okay? That means they can combine, can give an overall effect. They can combine and give you a sort of an average, okay? And that's the case for tall and short genes. Like if, your par if one of your parents is tall, the other one is short, chances are you're somewhere in the middle. If they're both tall, you'll probably be tall. If they're both short, you'll probably be short. So genes can combine to give you a sort of average, okay? So they can, someone, one can be dominant, recessive, it can be co-dominant, it can be additive, and, um, you know, and there's different ways in which these different forms of the gene can combine. I hope that made sense, but I think a lot of you have heard this stuff before. Uh, genetic expression, just the difference here between uh, genotype and phenotype. Um, the genotype is basically your genetic makeup. So let's say you're big B, big B, that means you are homozygous for brown eyes, okay? Or big B, little B, you're heterozygous for brown eyes. Or if you're little B, little B, you are homozygous for blue eyes. That's your genotype. So the genotype is just the genes Okay, and then the phenotype is the outward expression. The, the phenotype is just the outward characteristic. So your genotype can be, for instance, uh, big B, little b, right? And then your phenotype is brown eyes. Or it might be hazel, you know, depending. Okay, um, and we talked about whether they're dominant or co-dominant, recessive, and a lot of you probably already know about this, but you have to know this. There's this little thing right here on the right, this little Punnett square that shows you how, uh, how eye color can combine. So let's say the mother 
on the top, let's say, has genotype big B, little b, okay? Brown eyes, the mother has brown eyes. And then the father also has brown eyes on the side over here, uh, big B, little b. If you combine that, that gives you the chances for your offspring, for your children. And it's kind of like, um, think of this like your multiplication table. You would have one big B over here and the little B over here and big B over here, little B uh, here. So it's kind of like the multiplication table. And I don't like that it put them both together. I like to separate them, okay, at the top so you can kind of like multiply them. So if you combine the two big Bs, that'll give you brown eyes. You combine big B with little B, that's brown eyes. Big B over here with little B, that's brown eyes. And if you combine little B with little B, that's blue eyes. There's a one-fourth chance that your children will have blue eyes. And that's what happened with my wife. Her mother has brown eyes. Her father had brown eyes. And she's the only one born with blue eyes. So there was a one-fourth chance that she would be born with blue eyes, and she's the one who came out with blue eyes. But her father and mother both have brown eyes. But I guess they both have the blue eye gene. Okay, and you can see the relative combinations. There's a three-fourths chance you're going to have brown eyes if you have this kind of genotype for your mother and father. So you can get other scenarios, right? You can be homozygous for brown eyes and then have, and then have, and then other parent be homozygous for blue eyes. And you need to be able to figure out these combinations. And it's just like multiplication, okay? As a matter of fact, let me show you. Uh, no, you know what? I'm not going to show you right now. I'll save it until after I stop recording uh, because um, if I exit this screen, I'm going to have to log in again. So forget that. Hopefully you understand from this, but you'll have questions like this on the exam where you have to combine genotypes and then determine what the phenotype is or the chances of a certain, of a certain phenotype or a certain expression. Okay, and later on we'll talk about blood types and how those combine. Uh, here's some pictures for you guys. So there you have an albino skunk. As you guys know, albino skunks, you probably haven't seen one. Uh, they're very rare, which means that uh, the genes for uh, being an albino are probably recessive. And therefore, they don't show up that often. Okay? Uh, people can be albinos as well. Okay? And then over here, we have uh, someone with curly hair. Believe it or not, uh, the genes for curly hair are recessive. If you combine the gene for curly hair and the gene for straight hair, um, you'll get straight hair. Or maybe if they're co-dominant, if they're, actually they might be co-dominant, I don't really remember reading about it too much, but if they're co-dominant, then maybe you'll get wavy hair. But the point is, if you have curly hair, that means you inherited two recessive genes for curly hair. And actually, she might have permed her hair, I don't know. Um, looks like it's a, a, I don't know. But, um, you know, it could be natural or not. Um, and then uh, the, uh, he, there you see somebody making a kind of U shape with their tongue or making your tongue into a kind of a taco shape. Uh, that is due to a dominant gene. So if you have the gene for being able to curl your tongue like that, you can curl your tongue. And you know what? I'm one of those people who cannot curl his tongue, which means that I have the recessive gene for that. I have both recessive genes for tongue curling and I can't do it, okay? Uh, actually, my wife has uh, jokingly said that she has all the recessive genes. She has blue eyes. She's got uh, kind of curly hair um, and uh, other things, but she has, uh, she has quite a few recessive genes. I have mostly dominant genes. I have straight hair, but I can't curl my tongue. I have brown eyes. That's dominant. Okay, let's keep going and let's talk about some uh, chromosomal and genetic problems. You can have uh, problems that come up, and sometimes that can be due to mutations. There are spontaneous mutations. Spontaneous mutations is when there's a change in the genetic material uh, and it happens spontaneously for uh, any given number of reasons, okay? Sometimes there doesn't seem to be a reason at all, okay? There could be an error in the copying of the genetic information. It could be due to radiation or some other thing, okay? It can, it can cause mutations in the genetic material. Um, mutations at the genetic level, at the gene level, or the chromosomal level but sometimes it can cause problems. Sometimes it doesn't have an effect at all. And sometimes it can even be beneficial. Okay, so mutations can occur uh, for many different reasons. Uh, and actually they're more likely to happen if the mother uh, is over uh, 35, then she's more likely to have mutations uh, in her genetic material that she'll pass on to her offspring. Or if the father is over 40, then there's more likely to be mutations. And some of these can be harmful. Sometimes it's helpful 
rarely, okay? And a lot of times it's harmless. But genetic material can be altered, can be changed due to mutations that sometimes are just spontaneous and just seem to occur for no reason. Sometimes it's due to radiation or other effects. So let's talk about some of these genetic disorders. So genetic disorders are basically disorders or problems at the gene level. There's problems with the genes, uh, defective genes basically. And one of those examples is Tay-Zach's Tay disease, uh, which is a condition where basically cells in the spinal cord and the brain die. And it's a very horrible uh, disease. And if it's not treated, usually children will die by age four. There is treatment for it. I don't know enough about it to see how well people develop by, uh, with, with treatment. Actually, no, I do know a little bit more about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, those with that disorder usually die by age four, okay? Uh, even with treatment, it's, it's, it's bad, okay? It's really bad. And there's sickle cell anemia, which is another, it's due to a defective gene where your blood cells are kind of have a form of a sickle. They kind of have an indentation. They're not, they don't look perfectly round like they should. Um, actually, they're not perfectly round, but they have a shape of a sickle. They, they look like a, the shape of the moon or something like that, a sickle. Um, and that's a genetic disorder um, that, uh, and, and it makes people a little, feel a little bit more weak uh, and affects them, but also happens to have some benefits for uh, basically for malaria, you're less prone to having malaria if you have sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is actually more common in places where malaria is more of a problem, like in Africa or in other places where they live in dense rainforests and things like that. Um, so uh, they can also be beneficial in some ways, but sickle cell anemia does cause problems. Uh, not as bad as tay -Zach disease though. And PKU, it's a condition where due to a defective gene where you can't break down a chemical known as phenolalanine, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And if it's not treated, uh, it will lead to, uh, to problems and uh, uh, it will damage your brain and basically result in cognitive problems down the road. Okay. There's also, there's other, many other genetic disorders, but there's also disorders at the chromosomal level, meaning that there's a defect at the, for the chromosome, or there could be an extra one, or there's one missing. Okay. So chromosomal disorders are caused by abnormal or extra chromosomes. The chromosome could be defective and abnormal, or maybe you have an extra one and that can cause problems. Uh, here's some interesting ones. Klein-Felter syndrome is a chromosomal disorder where you have a male, but the sex chromosomes are X, X, Y. They have three rather than two sex chromosomes. So you can imagine that this will cause some problems. These, um, they're technically male because they have a Y. So by the way, uh, when it comes to the sex chromosomes, if you only have X's, you're a female. If you have a Y, you're gonna be a male. Even if you have two other X's, you're genetically a male, okay? Um, and by the way, uh, and, and of course, you could also be missing a chromosome, but here you have two X's, which you think you'd be a female, right? But you have a Y, which makes you a male. And, and all the Y chromosome pretty much does is turn you into a male. So if the Y is present, you're genetically a male but you tend to be infertile, you can't reproduce. And um, you know, you have otherwise a, uh, you know, a male and uh, that will require some hormonal treatment at puberty because they'll start developing breasts at puberty and things like that. So, but otherwise, you know, they will look and act like males because the Y chromosome basically is, basically says, okay, you're, you're gonna be a male, but they also have an extra X, which means they'll get, you know, too much of that, uh, female kind of hormonal influence and they'll require some treatment to kind of offset those effects, okay? Turner syndrome is interesting. Now, Turner syndrome, they, uh, the sex chromosomes, it's XO, which means that you have one X and then the O is really a zero, it means there's nothing else. There's no Y, there's no other X, there's only one X. Now, because there's no Y, this is a female. They tend to be infertile and short. And actually, my cousin's daughter has Turner syndrome. And basically that means she can't reproduce, she doesn't get her period. Um, as a, but I, actually they can get hormonal treatment at puberty, when they start puberty, so they can get hormonal treatment so they can get their pe period and stuff like that. But they're infertile, they tend to be kind of short and kind of pudgy and overweight. That's Turner syndrome. They have one X, they have no other X, they don't have a Y, a Y would make the male, but they only have one X. Uh, I can tell you some other things. Uh, those with Turner syndrome tend to be hyper feminine. They're very stereotypically female. They love dolls and jewelry and makeup. 
and are very non-aggressive. They're, they're, they're hyper females. And then you have the hyper male XYY uh, syndrome. So these are males, they have a Y, but they have two Ys. So they're like the super male. They tend to be taller than average. They're taller than average. They basically get more testosterone, more male hormone. So they tend to be taller, okay? Uh, they're prone to more acne as well. And they tend to be more aggressive and antisocial because they get more testosterone. They don't necessarily have to be more aggressive. The antisocial problems uh, don't always have to do with violence or aggression. Sometimes it's other things, but that's due to the presence of the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome basically says, let's make this person a male. They're gonna get more testosterone and male hormone. And if you have two Ys, then you're gonna have more male hormones and you're gonna grow taller, probably have broader shoulders. Uh, and uh, you know, you're gonna have more acne and you're gonna be more antisocial. Uh, stereotypical males are kind of like that, big and strong and don't give a rat's ass, <laughs> you know, and uh, are kind of that way. You know, it's a hyper male, basically. Uh, lower intelligence as well. I guess being too male also means you're not going to be that bright. Being a hyper male is not, uh, does, not mean, uh, mean, does not mean you're going to be so intelligent. Uh, the stereotypical male is not that bright, and that's what this does to you. Too much male hormone, okay? Uh, testosterone is helpful for some kinds of uh, uh, some kinds of things, some kinds of intelligence. Okay, but uh, your stereotypical hyper male is not that bright. Okay, and then there are those with Down syndrome that have an extra chromosome that I'll tell you more about. Here's more information about Down syndrome. There's a kid there with Down syndrome. Uh, these uh, children look kind of recognizable. They all look a certain way. They tend to have kind of almond-shaped eyes, uh, you know, and uh, ah. A, a thick tongue, you know, and thicker necks and things like that. They, they look very recognizable. If you would see a, a whole bunch of them together, uh, it would look like they're related, but they're not necessarily related, but it leads to certain physical features that are prevalent in, uh, in those that have Down syndrome. They're all recognizable. So it's also called trisomy 21 because the 21st pair of chromosomes, there's an extra copy of it. So there's three copies of the 20, instead of being two, uh, two for the 21st uh, pair of chromosomes, uh, there's three, there's three of those chromosomes. So it involves about 300 distinct characteristics, about 300 different features that set these people apart. Uh, I have to do with that third chromosome, okay? And make these individuals unique. There's supposed to be a little bit more information here under the picture, but that's not showing up. And that's because of uh, me presenting on the iPad and through Canvas. It does some weird things like that, but the information you need is right here. Uh, Down syndrome, it's a, an extra chromosome that all of you probably have heard about this. And then there's, uh, okay, so beyond genes, there's some more information here, methylination. That's the process that where uh, genes uh, are, uh, can uh, genetic, you know, basically genetic tendencies can be enhanced, uh, you know, or, or genetic information is transcribed or copied, it's connected, uh, um, you know, genetic information or genes are empowered or genes are silenced, enhanced, things like that. So the thing about this genetic information or, or genes and things like that is they can be turned on and off or it can become more active or it might have a weak effect or they can combine, connect. Um, that is called methylation, the process basically that silences, turns on genes or makes them more active, things like that. Uh, our, both RNA and DNA can alter genetic instructions. The genetic instructions can be altered um, as things are transcribed and copied, okay? RNA regulates and transcribes genetic uh, instructions. I'm not gonna mention RNA and, you know, uh, beyond this. Uh, it's a little bit more advanced for, than the purposes that we need to get into for this class. But basically, genetic material can be altered, enhanced, it can be turned on and off, and that is called methylation. Okay, so it's more complicated than it might seem at the beginning. And epigenetics is basically the study, says there, the study of how environmental factors affect genes and genetic expression, enhancing, halting, shaping, or altering the genetic expression of genes. So genetic information, genes can also be altered by the environment. The environment might enhance a certain genetic tendency or might suppress it. So just like uh, Myth with methylation, where it happens at the genetic level where things can be turned on and off, the environment can kind of cause things to kind of be suppressed or enhanced or, um, you know, 
affected in, uh, in, in some way like that. So an example here, let's say you have the genes for artistic expression. You have those genes that you're supposed to be an artist, but you grow up in an environment where, uh, where artistic tendencies are not encouraged. Let's say your parents don't care about that stuff. You go to a crappy school where they don't really have any arts, no music or, or anything like that. Um, so, the, so that tendency isn't nurtured and you don't become an artist. You have the genes for an artist, but your artistic tendencies are suppressed to some extent, or you know you can maybe draw well and things like that, but it wasn't developed to the extent where you could have made a career out of this. Okay, and there's other, other examples like that, where you can have the genes for something, but they don't develop in, that, in the way that uh, the genes would suggest. Like for instance, I probably have the genes for being an alcoholic, but I'm not an alcoholic because of my education and other things that have affected my choices and I have not become an alcoholic, but I can easily become one if I drink. Actually, I, don't, I can't control my alcohol very well. When I drink, I drink too much. So uh, I usually try to stay away from alcohol. Okay, nature and nurture interact. So here's the thing. Uh, the nature is your biology, nurture, no, uh, yeah. Nature, no, nature's biology, yes, and nurture is your environment. So here's the thing. Um, genes and environments can interact in different ways. Like I was talking about alcohol. Al alcoholism uh, nowadays um, can be called alcohol, and some people choose to call it alcohol use disorder. It's recognized as a disorder, alcohol use disorder. So some people have a genetic tendency to become alcoholics, um, but alcoholism is actually polygenetic. What that means is that there's many genes that are involved in being an and having those alcoholic tendencies. Not one gene, but many. Poly means many, many genetics. And culture is pivotal. Your culture is going to have an effect on whether you become an alcoholic or not. I probably have the genes because I have a bunch of alcoholics in my family, including my dad. And, you know, everyone's an alcoholic, it seems. Um, my culture basically uh, is that way. You know, every time people get together, they drink and they drink too much. Encouraged to drink before you can legally drink at a young age. And uh, it's just the way we socialize and we have fun. Um, I will drink when during a social occasion, but I don't go out that often, especially now during the pandemic. Um, so, and then I've, I've had quite an education. I studied alcohol. I'm an expert actually on alcohol. I, I, my specialty was a, uh, um, aggressive behavior due to alcohol. Um, and I've studied a lot and I choose, I purposely choose to stay away from it. It's part of my education, so to speak. So I'm not an alcoholic because of what I've learned because of some of my environment, okay? Or some of the environmental influence. But if you have the culture, right? And the genes that both basically, uh, you know, kind of have that, that, you know, that pull, that tendency, you're probably gonna become an alcoholic. Okay, unless something else stops you, okay? Something you learned or something, some experience. Uh, another, so alcohol, uh, alcoholism or alcohol use disorder, it's an example, basically how things are more complicated. That involves genes and environment that are involved in alcoholism. Not just, uh, not just the genes, okay? It's not just environment either. Alcoholism, I think, is, uh, is uh, less common among uh, people of Asi Asian descent. Uh, because a lot of Asians are, are lacking a certain gene uh, and, and a lot of them cannot tolerate alcohol. So alcoholism is less common in, in that culture. Nearsightedness is another example of how genes and, and environment can interact. Nearsightedness, okay? Uh, so age has something to do with nearsightedness. You're more likely to, have, uh, uh, to be nearsighted or have vision problems in general as you get older. Your vision works better when you're younger. Your genes, some people have better vision genetically than others, okay? But also your culture will affect your vision, okay? Uh, the kind of things that you're doing will affect your vision. Well, basically strain your eyes and affect your eyesight, okay? Uh, so here's the thing, think about what you guys are doing now. You're always connected, right? Always on that phone, always on that iPad. Your generation will have more problems down the road and more likely to wear glasses down the road. I had really good vision up until uh, maybe like 10 years ago. I'm in my 40s now. And why? It's because I've been studying so much. I've so much, you know, so much screen time, so much, uh, you know, it, it, my vision has gotten worse through a lot of usage, you know, and, and also because it's also uh, genetics. My mother wears glasses and things like that. So I have the genes for it, but I have really good vision for a long time. But in my family, as we get older, our vision gets worse. And that's the case for most people, but some people's vision is gonna get worse than others. 
And some people will still have good vision when they're older. It has to do with your age, your genes, but also your culture, also your environment, and uh, basically how you're using your vision and how you're damaging it and affecting it. Okay. Uh, Sex-linked genetic disorders. Okay. So here's another thing uh, um, on how basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, your genes can kind of uh, combine, um, genetic material can kind of combine to give you a, uh, a certain outcome. Remember we were talking about phenotypes and genotypes, right? The genotype is gen genetic material and the phenotype is the outward expression. Okay. So here's the thing. Sex-linked genetic disorders are abnormal genes, um, abnormal genes that are on the X chromosome. So the X chromosome um, is the one that basically makes you female. The Y makes you male. There are defective genes that are on the X chromosome. And one example is the gene for being a hemophiliac, which means you'll have problems uh, with your blood clotting. So if you get a cut, you'll bleed more than you normally would because your blood doesn't clot naturally the way it should. So that's one example. And these uh, gene, defective genes are on the X chromosome. Now males, as you know, have one X chromosome. A normal male has one X chromosome and then a Y, right? Uh, so for a male, if the male has the defective gene on the X chromosome, that male is gonna have the disorder. That, in that case, that male will have the uh, hemophilia, okay? We'll have a problem with blood clotting because he doesn't have another X. He doesn't have a normal version of the gene to cancel it out, okay? This is due to a recessive gene, okay? So he has the defective gene on the X and then he has a Y and the Y doesn't have the non-defective version of the gene. So the male is gonna have hemophilia. Now for the female, females have two X chromosomes. So for a female to be a hemophiliac, the female has to have two copies of the gene, one on each X. So hemophilia is gonna be a lot less common in females. If a female has only one copy of the gene on one X, then that female is known as a carrier and carries the defective gene, but will not have the disorder. Another example is colorblindness. And it combines just like with our little Punnett square, um, you know, where you put the genes uh, for uh, the genotype for the mother on the top and the father here on the side, and you do it like the multiplication and you combine them. And uh, you know, if, uh, if you have a female with the, defective version of the gene, if she only has one copy, that female right there, that's a, that's, that's a carrier. And this is a normal female, doesn't have a defective version of the gene. Here's a, uh, a male that's gonna be a hemophiliac. He has the defective gene. And here's a normal whale, a normal male that doesn't have the defective gene. So you need to know how to combine these. And they combine just like the, the thing with the brown eyes. Don't let the little subscript there. I actually like to put it as a superscript at the top. Don't let that kind of uh, uh, fool you. Uh, just combine it with the subscript and see where the defective one lands. And if you have, let's say, a mother that has no defective copy of the gene, but the father does, you have to know the combinations, combine them, and how to determine is there a one-fourth chance, a 50% chance, a three-fourths chance that this, that this person will be a hemophiliac or have color blindness, things like that. I'll try to show you a little bit on the uh, whiteboard uh, after we end, but I want to see how much time we're going to have. So yes, uh, genes can be on the defective, uh, the defective gene can be on the X chromosome, which means that they'll be more common in males because females require two copies of the defective gene. Some basic stuff about reproduction at the cellular level. There's two kinds, there's mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is basically what we call asexual reproduction. It's reproduction of the cells, uh, that is not sexual, that doesn't involve any kind, anything to do with sex, okay? I'll have to explain when we get to uh, meiosis, okay? So basically, this is a kind of reproduction where the cells kind of copy themselves, they duplicate themselves and make exact copies of themselves. The cells uh, can be specialized to become muscle, bone, skin, any of those, any of those things uh, and other things. But here's the thing, you see the image there, you have a cell there, uh, uh, in the in the nucleus, and you know, and they, basically what happens is that the the genetic material divides and doubles itself, and then the cell splits into two. So you get two identical copies. These are called daughter cells, the ones at the end. Two identical copies of the mother cell, the cell that you started with. That is called mitosis. Okay, 
It's asexual reproduction. It's reproduction that leads to just new cells that are identical. And that's what happens when you, you, know, when you grow muscles, when you, you know, bones, uh, skin, hair, that kind of stuff. That's all due to mitosis. But there's also sexual reproduction or, or you know, all we call meiosis, where we're talking at the cellular level here, the kind of reproduction that has to do with, uh, with the sperm and the ovum, okay? It's sexual reproduction. Uh, sperm and ovum are called germ cells, okay? And when they reproduce, uh, they, uh, they have themselves. The genetic material is halved, okay? So if you look at the image here, you have a, uh, that could be an ova or a, uh, or a sperm cell. Oh, no, that, that's, that, that's just, um, we start out with a cell like this, actually. No, no, no it, that's not an ovum or sperm cell, but you, you start out with a cell like that. It duplicates itself, okay? And then it divides again so that the genetic material is halved, okay? So at first it duplicates and gets the uh, exact copies of, uh, of, of all the genetic material. And then it splits in half with half the genetic material going one way and half uh, going the other way. So when it splits like this, that is where it will become a germ cell, a sperm or ova. And, uh, and basically will, uh, no, actually, males only produce sperm and females only produce ova, okay? So here's the thing. It will divide again so the genetic material is half. So a sperm only contains half of the genetic information. And so does the ova. The ova only contains half of the genetic information as well. And of course, when you have sex and then those two things combine, then they fuse together and then you get the full uh, genetic information needed to produce a human being. The sperm only has half of it. The ovum only has half of it. And that's called meiosis. That's sexual reproduction where the genetic material is halved. Okay, at first it duplicates and then it splits in half so that the daughter cells will only end up with half of the genetic material. And the daughter cells can be sperm or ovum, but males can only produce sperm and, uh, and females can only produce ova, okay? Now, a little bit more about reproduction, okay? Uh, male and female uh, sex cells are called gametes. Just some terminology there, they're called gametes. Uh, as I told you guys, this is all obvious stuff. Testes produce sperm, we already know that, that's the male gamete. Ovaries produce ovum, that's the female gamete, okay? The sperm and the ovum uh, fuse together and the genetic material is combined. And that will give you the 46 chromosome. Half of them come from the sperm, half of them come from the ova. And here's a little image here, right? We have the, uh, the cells there containing half the genetic material. Uh, and then, you know, just the sperm will have a tail. So there's the ova and the sperm, okay? They combine together to give you a zygote. We'll learn about the zygote later when we, um, we talk about uh, di uh, prenatal development. They give you a zygote that has the complete genetic information, as long as it's a normal zygote, complete genetic information for making a human being. Okay, but you need both. That's sexual reproduction. And why, why does this even exist? What is the purpose of sexual reproduction? Well, you'll find out in a little bit. It leads to, more, it leads to more diversity. But before we get to that, let's, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about twins. There's monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. Dizygotic twins. Monozygotic twins is basically when uh, the, uh, the zygote splits. The zygote has the, that cell, uh, that actually the zygote that is dividing and stuff, has all genetic information and it splits into two identical copies. And then you get identical twins. Uh, naturally, it only is supposed to happen about one out of every 250 conceptions, one out of every 250 kind of times that the sperm and ovum uh, fuse, okay? But now with all the reproductive methods, all the fertility methods, you, now we get twins at about one out of every 10 conceptions. But that's because of fertility methods. Naturally, it doesn't happen that often, okay? Uh, dizygotic twins, are, those are called fraternal twins. Those, that's what happened there is that basically uh, what you have is two sperm, uh, basically uh, fertilize two separate ovum. Okay, and then you have basically two zygotes and you have two, uh, basically uh, two embryos developing inside the mother's womb at the same time. They're sharing the womb. Uh, those are dizygotic twins. Uh, you share only 
uh, you can't see it there, but you share only 50% of your genetic material. Uh, you're just like basically like siblings. Uh, siblings, whether they're brother or sister or two brothers, two sisters, they have 50% uh, of their genetic material is the same as the other, okay? 50%, because you get half from your mom, half from your dad. So if you have a brother or sister, you, identic, your genetic material is 50% identical to theirs. And th when you get dizygotic twins and you have two ovum fertilized by two sperm, they're sharing the womb, that's what you have. They're called dizygotic twins. Genetically, they're no more similar than regular brother and sister or brother, brother, sister, sister, but they do share the womb and they're born at a similar time. So they're a little more, more special than regular brother, sister, or two brothers or two sisters. But those are called dizygotic twins. And you could have, you know, uh, you know uh, doubles, triplets, quadruplets, things like that can happen. But usually when you have triplets, quadruplets, that's because of fertility methods, which we'll mention a little bit of at the end. A little bit more about reproduction here. Um, so meiosis, why is meiosis uh, useful? What is that, why is that sexual reproductive uses uh, useful? If we only reproduce through mitosis, then that means that you can only make an exact copy of yourself. And there are some organisms that reproduce that way. They just make exact copies of themselves. But meiosis is a little bit better because you get more possibilities when you have uh, basically, you know, genetic information being combined from two separate sources, okay? So with meiosis, you get 8 million different uh, chromosomally different, uh, 8 million chromosomally different sperm or ova possible. 8 million possible combinations there, okay? And then there's also something known as crossing over uh, where the chromosomes actually exchange genetic information. And when you combine it with crossing over, uh, with those changes, then you have 64 trillion possibilities. And then mutations create even more variations. So chances are that unless you have an identical twin, that there has never been anyone exactly like you, that you are absolutely unique. There's no one exactly like you. Unless you have a twin, unless that zygote split and made two identical copies and you have a twin and then you share 100% of your DNA, with your twin, but only at the beginning, okay? As you get older, there will be mutations and there will be changes because of the environment create changes. So by the time you're older, and especially if you live to a ripe old age, uh, you will look a lot like your identical twin and you will be mostly the same, but genetically you will not be identical anymore, but you will be extremely similar. But because of mutations and, out, and, and other alterations, um, your genetic information will change differently than that person's genetic information. But mostly you'll still be the same, okay? But most of us are unique, unless you're an identical twin. So if you're an identical twin, you're actually less special, not more special, I guess, right? Uh, no, nah, that's a uh, messed up to say. You are special, right? In a different way, I guess. But those of us who have no identical twins, we're unique. There's, we haven't had 64 trillion people. And that's how many possibilities there seem to be for combining this genetic material. Okay, more about reproduction. Okay, uh, this, kind, this stuff, is, some of this stuff is obvious. Some of it is, uh, just has to do with numbers. Okay, so, you know, uh, as you know, the ovum, um, the, basically the egg that is produced by the female, um, female only produces X, okay? So she could only contribute an X chromosome. So when you're talking about reproduction, a female could only give an X to the offspring. The sperm, actually, I was wrong about the sperm. I, I, I got confused, I guess. So it happens when you're, new, uh, when you're doing something new, you get, uh, you get confused. Okay, the sperm can actually carry both the X and the Y. The sperm can have an X or a Y. No, the sperm doesn't just get, so the sperm, actually, no, 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 that's, okay. So me, no, no, I, no I, I didn't misspeak. I said males can only produce sperm. Okay, they can't produce ovum. I was right. I'm getting confused here. But when it comes to the sperm, as far as the chromosome, the sperm can have an X or a Y. I didn't misspeak earlier. I got confused right now thinking I had misspoken. But yeah, the sperm can carry an X or it can carry a Y. It can be a sperm that has an X or a sperm that has a Y. So if, um, if, the, um, if the ovum is fertilized with a, by a sperm that carries an X, you're going to get a female. If the ovum is fertilized by a sperm that has a Y, you'll get a male. So believe it or not, it is the male who determines the sex of the child. The female, all the female can do is contribute an X. 
the male is the one that determines the variation of whether it's going to be a female or male. If he gives an X, it's a female. If he gives a Y, it's a male. Okay? The female has nothing to do with whether it's a boy or a girl because all she can do is give an X. Okay? I wouldn't say nothing, but let's just say the, the male determines the variation. So remember that, you guys remember in history, there were those, you know, Henry VIII beheaded uh, some of his wives because they wouldn't give him an, a male heir to the throne. It's actually his fault. He wasn't getting any males. Not the female's fault, but he blamed them and had some of them beheaded. I, I really messed up, right? But, uh, you know, it was his fault, right? It's his sperm that was determining if it was a male or a female. Uh, if uh, a sperm with a Y chromosome, a sperm with, that have the Y chromosome are actually lighter and faster because the Y chromosome is actually small. It's like a, it, it's like a chromosome that's been kind of, uh, you know, uh, that's missing some parts or something. It looks like a Y. It looks defective, but it's a Y chromosome. It's smaller and it's just smaller and lighter. So the sperm that have the Y chromosome will actually be able to swim faster, a little bit faster. And chances are those sperm will get there first to the ovum. So actually during conception, uh, fertilization, you'll get 160 males being conceived for every 100 females. So conceptions are more likely to be male. But actually, um, you know, uh, there's also uh, males, uh, the male, uh, the the male zygotes are all actually uh, a bit weaker and more likely to have abnormalities. So there's only, so they're, they're more likely to be aborted spontaneously and more likely to be rejected by the body. So by the time uh, the, uh, the child is born, you're, you have 105 males born for every 100 females. And female babies are actually more resistant to disease and actually stronger than males. And male babies are more likely to die. So by the time you get to... Uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to like, uh, you know, I don't, by the time you get to adulthood, actually, what, by the time you get there, you're actually going to have more females than males. We have more females in our society than males. And that's the way it is in most societies. And it's because males are more likely to die. They're more sickly. They're weaker. But, you know, we talk about males being strong and being stronger than females. It's actually the opposite. It's actually the females that are stronger. And there's a reason why the females are the ones that give birth. Okay. Um, and males also get involved with, uh, you know, some really stupid things. They drive too fast. They're aggressive. Uh, they're more likely to, uh, to sign up, to go to war, and more likely to get killed. Now, not all of those things are stupid, but, but if they put themselves more at risk, these males. So more males get killed. And then in, a, in most societies, you have more females than you do males. And what does that mean? That means that females have to compete a little bit more for a good male so they can marry a good man, Okay. Um, that's what's, you know, looking at these numbers tells us a little bit. Um, assisted reproduction. Um, here's the thing. Um, I, I said now that nowadays uh, you're more likely to have multiple births. Uh, twins are more common um, and you're more likely to have, a, you know, fraternal twins and, and triplets and quadruplets. And that's because these, uh, these assisted reproductive methods, like in vitro uh, fertilization, okay, uh, what they do is they get the sperm from the male and the ovum from the female, and they, uh, you know, they put them in a petri dish, and they let the sperm fertilize the ovum, and then they get the fertilized egg, the zygote, and then they put it into the mother's, uh, into the woman's uterus, because for some reason she's having difficulty having children, and she has trouble getting pregnant, uh, or something like that. So they'll they'll try that method, and uh, and a lot of the uh, zygotes won't make it; they'll get rejected. Uh, or they'll die. So often what they'll do is they'll put, they'll, they'll have several zygotes that they fertilize with the husband's sperm and the, and the mother's ovum. And they'll have several of them and they'll put them in the mother's uterus. And in the case of the octomom, they put eight inside her. That's the octomom. She gave birth to eight children. So she had, what do you call that? Uh, octuplets? I don't know if that's, the, that's a word, but she had eight, okay? And they're not identical, but she had eight different zygotes implanted into her, um, and uh, and they all survived. And usually, most of them do not survive. So um, you know, she's well known for that. And then she got a lot of trouble with people, and they were attacking her uh, because uh, you know, because for several reasons. And they were, were really mean to her. Um, but that's uh, a, a, a that's assist, assisted reproduction to help people who have trouble reproducing naturally 
have uh, children. And they'll use methods like this, and it leads to more multiple births, okay? In some countries, it's not allowed, so there are legal restrictions. There's a whole bunch of other methods that are actually not mentioned uh, so, so much in your book, but there's assisted insemination with husband sperm. Uh, there's in, we talk about in vitro. There's all, also gamete interfallopian transfer. It's hard to see this, I know, but you don't have to know all this detail, but there's many other methods. And the one that I think is interesting uh, for a specific reason is surrogacy or gestational host, where basically uh, the couple decides that, uh, that uh, basically that, that uh, another person, another woman will have the child for them. And it could happen in several ways where the, they have a zygote implanted in, the, uh, in that person, where they get the sperm from the father and the, uh, and, and the ovum from the mother, and they put it, in, and they put it into that other woman, because for some reason this woman can't have uh, children. Um, and then she's supposed to give up the child after. They have an arrangement, and the person is pay, who carries the child uh, to term and gives birth uh, is rewarded handsomely, by the way. It's very expensive. They get a lot of money for that. Okay, but there's also other ways to do it. It varies, okay? Um, you know, the simplest way is to, for the, the couple, for the, the, you know, the wife to just uh, allow the, her husband to have sex with another woman and get her pregnant. And then, they, and then she gets pregnant and they have a, a child and then the child is given to the couple, right? But that happens already uh, in many different ways with many people with, uh, through cheating. But that is surrogacy. Sometimes they do that, those things on purpose. And then the mother who, give, who, uh, who, uh, who, who basically has the child is supposed to then give it up to the couple. And there are problems, legal problems, that sometimes the mother doesn't want to give it up or the one that actually uh, you know, gave birth. Um, but uh, it's a complicated thing. But there's all the other methods, these other methods that are more likely to lead to multiple births. Okay, I will stop recording here.